Mr. Snyder, Professor Snyder, excuse me. Uh, thank you for accepting my invitation. I really appreciate that. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. How are okay. you? Thank you too. Uh, let's start with, you know, I will be a little bit provocative. Ukraine elected a showman and comedian for a president just a few days ago. Um, is the liberal democracy turning nowadays into a comedy, a farce, a parody of something it should be? I, I think that this is a danger that is built into democracy, mm -hmm. especially if we regard democracy as something which is there to please us. If we, if we make the shift in our minds where we think of democracy as a form of entertainment that is meant to please us, then democracy will collapse in this way. But of course, democracy is not a show to please us. Democracy is a way of carrying out politics. Mm -hmm. Politics is, should be a distinct thing from, from entertainment. But yes, I mean, I think the trend is in the direction that you're talking about. And I think it has to do, it has to do in large measure with the internet, um, which helps us to confuse what is entertainment and, and what is politics. And all, it also, the internet teaches us that the whole world is basically um, a show which is supposed to end the way that we want it to end. And that's not the best form of political education. Okay. Um, you said something that it's a kind of tendency. I would rephrase you in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you comment the, the global tendency around the, uh, around the world, you know, uh, of this protest vote, uh, people uh, like clowns, I would say, tax evaders, even populists are going, you know, are being elected to top level positions in societies uh, all around the world. Uh, how would you comment? How, how, how would you, um, yeah, how would you comment this irresponsible and reckless kind of voting? Well, I, it's a good question because on the one hand, it's very easy just to say, well, people are doing these things that don't make sense. And it's also very easy to say, uh, well, these are bad leaders, right? In Europe, people talk all the time about how the quality of leadership is not very high. But as you suggest, there must be some deeper phenomena. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would suggest three. The first is um, globalization itself, where it's very easy for people to imagine that there's something beyond the borders of their own country, which is responsible mm -hmm. for what's going on. And it's very easy for the politicians you're calling populists to say that that something is actually a group of people as opposed to some sort of problem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's not competition, it's a specific kind of migrant, right? A second tendency has to do with the disappearance of the future, or in particular, with the disappearance of social advance, at least in the West. In, the, in countries like Russia or the US, or for that matter, Britain, where uh, inequalities of wealth and income are growing, people have a harder time thinking about the future. And when you can't think about the future, democracy starts to crack because democracy assumes that choices that we make now are going to make some difference for the future. Once you no longer care about the future, once you're not voting in a pragmatic way, then you're going to be tempted to vote for, you know, these characters, like these people who justify the way things are, as opposed to people who can actually change things. And I think the, the, the third reason why we're being driven in this direction is that, uh, is that we spend, I mean, I said it before, but it's that we spend so much time online. And what being online does is that it trains us to be entertained. It mm -hmm. trains us to expect that everything is going to be pleasing every few seconds, every few minutes. And that, of course, gives us an, gives an advantage to people who have a certain skill set, right? Because, I mean, Donald Trump is not a statesman. Um, he's, he's not even a businessman. But he is an entertainer. He does have a certain <laughs> skill set. And I think the, inter the Internet prepares us for that skill set. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's start from the beginning of your answer, Great Britain. Uh, what's your comment on, you know, we have clear examples of good example of, you know, referendums like Switzerland and the result in Great Britain, the Brexit referendum. So what's your comment on that? You know, 
are that kind of uh, direct democracy good enough or the people have to be more made sure you know to to use it as a tool to to elect and to make you know political decisions concerning their nations their countries right i mean there 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 are two there are two ways to talk about brexit one is the form of the referendum and one is the result mm -hmm. so i'm not going to talk about the result unless you ask again i'm just going to talk about the form <laughs> okay in in switzerland um and this is true of certain, you know, of certain localities in the United States as well. Referenda are a normal part of politics. Okay. People know what referenda are, and the referenda are about specific political questions where the where the yes or the no have specific political consequences. Moreover, there are rules about the referenda, about how they are run and and, and how they are funded, or what form the the publicity or the propaganda can take. In Great Britain in 2016, none of this was true. Great Britain was a, is a parliamentary democracy with very little experience in referenda. The referendum that was run was run basically without rules. And the result was that any basically any kind of publicity or propaganda was allowed, which meant that people lied and, you know, outrageously. But beyond that, it also meant that foreign actors were able to fund, especially one side of, of, of the campaign. And beyond that, there was no there was no awareness and no effort to change how the how the how the referendum was run over the Internet, which had the effect that Twitter bots had a, few, a huge effect on the debate without anyone even noticing that. Mm -hmm. Right. So the British go to the polls after a debate, which is largely organized by Russian Twitter bots, mm -hmm. but they're not even aware that this is the case. So the form of the referendum, oh, and one more problem, the referendum is not binding, right? So it's a kind of fantasy. How do you feel, right? How do you feel about this theoretical possibility? And the referendum was not, as it was, not only was it non-binding, it was not actually about anything. Mm -hmm. Because the Brexit that was proposed in the referendum was not actually a policy reality. Right. There was no specific notion of what it meant to leave. So I think the referenda are fine so long as they are an integral part of a political system with, where people know the rules. Mm -hmm. But the refer these kinds of one off referenda are extremely disruptive for the rule of law. Um, and that's why, by the way, dictators like referenda and it's why radicals like referenda, because if you just have referenda that kind of come out of nowhere, what they do is they create a moment, an exceptional moment inside a democracy where everything starts to shudder and shake and become unpredictable. Okay. Uh, before asking you about the foreign actors, you provoked me and I will ask you, how do you comment the result of the referendum in Great Britain? Well, so I, 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 I want to say that as with a lot of Trump voters in the US and as with protest voters in Europe and elsewhere, I can certainly understand some of the feelings that people had or even some of the interests that people were trying to express when they voted against um, the European Union. I can understand people who believe that um, the future has been taken away from them. Mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. understand that people who think that uh, globalization is not working for them because very often it's not. However, I think taking Britain out of the European Union would generally make those very kinds of issues worse. I think taking Britain out of the European Union would lead to a situation where England, because it would be England, mm -hmm. England would be much more vulnerable to the very kinds of pressures that, pre that protest voters are feeling and are worried about. Conceptually, um, I mean, as a historian, conceptually, I think the big problem with the Brexit debate and the debate about Europe in general is that everyone assumes that there are these European nation states and these European nation states can just come and go from the European Union. But that's not what history actually shows. History actually shows that the European nation state has a rather problematic existence, um, mm -hmm. that, the, that Europe is the big history of Europe is the history of empires and that the European states have thrived either as, as, the, as part of an empire or as part of an integration project. Everyone in Europe takes for granted that you can just pull a state out of the European Union like a like a puzzle piece from a puzzle and somehow it will all make sense but it won't it won't actually make sense this is the big mistake okay the um, in one of your books which was translated into Bulgarian you speak about uh, the 
politics of eternity. So the politicians of eternity, they refer quite often, they refer to United States as an empire. Is United States empire? Uh, In so the you, sense I, of your book, sorry. I, I take it you mean not you mean po politicians of eternity who are outside the United States say that. Oh yeah, of course, of course, yeah. We will gradually yeah. come to Russia and Putin, but you know, first that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think the United States, like Great Britain, France, you know, just Russia, Germany, um, is a country that is shifting from empire to a rule of law democracy. And, and that, but that there is nothing foreordained or necessary about that shift. So I don't think that the US is an empire in the sense that it controls the world the, the same way that say Britain controlled India. Um, I think that's an abuse of the term. But I do think that the United States has imperial features. For example, the fact that we still don't really have an equal right to vote for African Americans, right? We still have something like second class citizenship, or we still have the vestige of the conquest of the, of the American frontier in a very unequal situation for Native Americans in the country. In, in that sense, I, I think the US still has imperial features. And I have no trouble seeing the history of the United States as part of the same history of European frontier colonization um, that is, I think, the main feature of, of, of modern history from, let's say, the, the 16th through the 20th centuries, right? I have, United States is part of history. I do not like American exceptionalists to imagine that you can start again or we're a city on the hill or there's something, you know, there's something unique about us which allows us to be ignorant about the world. We're part of the mainstream of history. What I don't think, though, is that we're an empire in the sense of having total control of everything. So it depends a little bit on who you're asking about, right? Mm -hmm. As a historian, I have no trouble seeing American history as an imperial history. However, um, if, if, you, if you're specifying particular Russian politicians of, 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 of eternity who imagine that Americans are responsible for everything evil that happens in the world, obviously I'm not going to go along with that. Okay. <laughs> Foreign actors and the uh, European politicians of eternity probably Kremlin and, you know, official uh, policy of Moscow, Russian Federation, Mr. Putin, is one of the most brilliant examples of what you're talking about. How do you comment Europe between Orban, so-called Orbanism, Putinism, even Poland, if you want? So what's your overall observation of the nowadays Europe between those? Yeah, I mean, first of all, Russia is much more important than anyone else. It's interesting that, you know, West European and American critics focus on Poland and Hungary. Of course, what's happened in Hungary is important and what's happening in Poland is important. But if one is concerned about the decline of democracy or the rule of law or factuality, Russia is a hundred times more important. It's a much more important country. And unlike Poland and Hungary, it, it has very successfully and quite consciously exported its own methods of domestic politics out into the world. And un unlike Poland and Hungary, Russia regards itself, and in the digital age, in fact, is a, a great power. Um, and what they have done as a great power is to export ways of thinking about the world, um, a kind of hyper skepticism or cynicism about factuality, which has made civil society and the rule of law and democracy harder in Britain, the US and inside the European Union. So my first point would be that these are not these are not equal cases. Um, Poland, Hungary, and Russia are not equal cases. Russia is just much, much, much more important. It's also more important because Russia has reached a kind of extreme. Russia is Russia is like almost an ideal type of a digital oligarchy, um, a place where the people who have all the money also have all the power and also control the most important media resources. So because Russia really is like that, it helps us to see where those trend lines actually go in the rest of the world. Okay, my, my second comment is about, will be about Poland and Hungary. The problem with, Pol one of the problems with Poland and Hungary is that when you join the European Union, when you're trying to join the European Union, you behave well, right? But then once you're inside the European Union, there are, there are a few mechanisms to maintain this. From the point of view of Poland and Hungary themselves, the problem is that they treat some politicians treat Europe just as a source of money as opposed to um, something to which we have to contribute. 
And this goes back to the issue of nation states. It's a myth in Poland and Hungary, as it's a myth everywhere else, that you can have a nation state and it's going to thrive and be prosperous without some kind of some kind of connection to a larger entity. Um, and so I think the real question for Poles and Hungarians is how does one positively add something to Europe as opposed to making Europe responsible for for all of your problems? And then my third comment is about the European Union. The European Union is not used to having enemies. The European Union is used to saying we are the nice people who believe in um, the market, but also the welfare state. We believe in social rights, but also human rights. We do all the right things. We're innocent. We've learned that war is bad. Everybody likes us. But of course, that's not true. The Russian Federation's official foreign policy is to bring about the destruction of the European Union, and they say so more or less openly pretty much all the time. And there, of course, there are also forces, usually oligarchical ones in the United States, who would like the European Union to be destroyed. And the reason for that is that the European Union represents a certain kind of future or a possible future um, where, you know, where oligarchy is harder and where media is fairer and so on and so forth. But my point is that the European Union has to recognize that it's under attack um, for, it to, for it to sensibly react to the situation that it's in. Okay. Uh, a little more about liberal democracy. Uh, mm -hmm. did, it, did it change, and if yes, how, from the times of post-war consensus in Europe after the World War II, to up to nowadays when we clearly see there is, a, any, there is some kind of problem? And if change, you know, how did it change? So, I mean, first of all, I would, I would strongly resist any sort of myth about how there was a time when democracy was easy and uncontested. Democracy has always been hard. It's always, I mean, in a way, like the point about democracy is hard. If you want politics to be easy, then go off and be an authoritarian, right? Like if you want politics, if you want things to be easy, just give up and like let the oligarchs run everything. Democracy is hard. It's always been hard. I mean, the Greeks who we still respect, Plato and Aristotle, thought that democracy was too hard and they made a and they made serious arguments about why it's just too hard why we can't manage it so democracy is difficult it's always been difficult the idea that there was a post war consensus after the second world war well i mean sure because um, be, because uh, European European imperialism had just fought and lost a war in Europe with the consequence that tens of millions of people had been killed either on the battlefield or as civilians mm -hmm. and parliamentary democracy seemed like the thing that was left over. I mean, if one wants to call that a consensus, fine. I would say that what happened really is that in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, in Europe, a new system was built. And that system relied upon not just democracy, but trade on a large scale. And that system was democratic, also in the sense that the European countries who were building the European Union were losing the non-democratic parts of their own states, by which I mean Indochina or Algeria or the Spanish Sahara. In other words, the European Union was becoming democratic as it was ceasing to be imperial. What I think is happening is that that long process has come to an end. And the real question is, can we now have, can we now have democracy, which is not the, def which is not a kind of residual category after wars of empire fail, basically, mm -hmm. or after empire is no longer possible. Can we have an, a democracy? Because the European story is like this. The European story is, well, you know, there was war and we realized it was bad. And so now we have democracy. That's not a good enough argument, right? The argument for democracy has to be something like we, as, a, as European democracies, can handle the actual problems of the 21st century better than the machines can, better than the authoritarians can, better than the oligarchs can. I think the crisis of democracy today is that, is that people are not able to make that kind of argument. Okay. Um, though, still a little more into this direction. What are, okay, if I want to attack somebody, I will search for his weak points. If we speak about this uh, dichotomy, this, you know, this fight, so to say, between the two kinds of politics, you know, eternity and in, uh, inevitability, what are the weak points of liberal democracy, the politicians of eternity attack? What are those weak points today? Yeah, so very briefly, I mean, what I mean by the politics of inevitability 
is the idea that there's no alternative to liberal democracy and that there's some mechanism out there in the world, not you, not me, not our fellow citizens, but some mechanism mm -hmm. like the market or like Europe that automatically is going to bring about democracy. So the weakness of the politics of inevitability is that it, 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 it dispenses with responsibility. Because if something else, the market or Europe is responsible for our democracy, that means that you and I don't actually have to try to rule. And of course, democracy means the people rule. The second weakness is that the politics of inevitability does away with ethics or does away with public ethics. Because if we believe deterministically that liberal democracy is the only alternative and that something else is bringing it about, then we don't have to make an argument as to why it's good. And that creates, that opens the field to all kinds of authoritarians who make ethical arguments. They may not be good ethical arguments, but they make ethical arguments about who we are and why we are, are and why we are virtuous. And then another weakness of the politics of inevitability is that it's blind. I mean, if you really think that there are no alternatives to liberal democracy, an alternative can walk through the door and hit you over the head and you're not going to recognize it, which is basically what happened in the 2010s. People kept saying there are no alternatives, even though the alternatives you know, walked into their walked into their houses, picked up a big piece of wood and hit them on the head. Um, I mean, that's what Russia did. That like Russia is an alternative. But Americans and, and Europeans nevertheless persistently deny that Russia is an alternative, even as Russia enters their own societies and starts to present themselves as as an alternative. So those are the weaknesses that you, you lose your sense of responsibility, you lose your sense of public ethics, and also you lose your sense of of, of what is of, of, of what is actually happening. You lose your ability to see, especially in international and in international politics. Okay. And the other, I mean, and then there's the technological weakness. So part of the determinism of the politics of inevitability, mm -hmm. especially in the U.S., is the idea that technology is making us smart and is making us free, which is just not true. I mean, the Internet is making us stupid and vulnerable. <laughs> and the and and the you know, it, it, no, I mean, it's a serious point. Since no, no. Yeah. platforms have become reality. Democracy has collapsed. Mm -hmm. And IQ, by the way, is also collapsing. So um, the, the Internet has made us stupid and vulnerable. And technically speaking, this then becomes an instrument which not just Russia, but plenty of other actors can use. And the politicians of inevitability are vulnerable to this because they're still all in this world of technology being you know, beneficent and automatically enlightening. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard you and I've read, you know, you saying that uh, the politics of eternity rests upon the understanding, the idea that the past was good. Uh, okay, but in post-communist countries, I belong to one of those, uh, there is a majority, I would say, or at least, you know, sufficient number of people who believe that and who know, actually, that the past wasn't good at all. It actually was violent, bloody, full of, you know, terror, etc. So, how does this idea of politics of eternity, that the past was something, something good, which we have to refer to, you know, by the cycles of time, fit within the framework of, you know, mindset of post-communist person, people? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that, that's, that, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think the answer is that with the, the politics of eternity is a myth about how things used to be good for us. So maybe not for everybody, but but for <laughs> us. And okay. And if there was and if there was a problem, the problem had to do with them. And so what the politics of eternity does is that it turns history, not necessarily into a myth about how everything was good all the time, but into a myth about how regularly, cyclically, the others are coming and taking away the thing that is good for us. But you're right. Like it doesn't like in the U.S., the politicians of eternity talk about the 1930s. But the 1930s were terrible. The 1930s were a time of Great Depression, right? In fact, it's, nobody would want to go back to the 1930s, either in the U.S. or in Europe. But the way the argument works is to say, well, back then we were in charge. And the thing which was wrong is that those other people, Jews, immigrants, blacks, whatever it is, those people came and took everything away from us. That's the way the politics Mexican, works. Mexicans. Mexicans today, yeah. 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 Okay, we, we're coming to, to the end gradually. Um, Part of the liberal democracy ideas is multiculturalism. Did it fail today? Well, it kind of depends on what you mean by multiculturalism. But I think if, if by multiculturalism we mean there are X number of cultures and those cultures have firm boundaries one from the other and we can proceed through life by 
properly defining those boundaries, then I don't believe that idea could ever work because cultures exist in their interaction with, with one another. And I think democracy is a rule of law societies prosper insofar as they provide the, the least bad way for different sorts of ideas of how to live to communicate one one with the other. So I'm not sure exactly what you meant by multiculturalism, but that's like that's my take. If multiculturalism means if multiculturalism is one more way of stopping history by saying, you know, this group is this for all time and that group is that for all time, okay. then it can't work. Right. Because that's simply historically not true. Mm-hmm. Um, I think democracies work insofar as they allow people to in a in a less bad way. Um, understand one another, right? Understand various points of view. But that's, you know, maybe you mean something more specific. Okay. No, I mean, you answered the question. Thank you. Last one. The governments which uh, rest upon the politics of eternity, uh, and I believe these were your words, they, uh, they, they have two kind of enemies, internal and external enemies. Is it not that the, that the external enemies, let's take Russia, for example, are actually our social and political weaknesses, which they use to amplify their politics of eternity. The, I mean, the trick, the whole, the trick with the politics of eternity, and this is true of other kinds of authoritarianism too, is true of Stalin, for example, is that you you pick enemies that you pick enemies that aren't really your enemies. You pick the enemies that, in some sense, you can manage. So. I mean, is is the European Union a meaningful enemy of the Russian Federation? I mean, not in any traditional geopolitical sense. No. It's a competitor, rather. Rather. It, no. Yeah, it, it has. It's a it's a different way of being in politics, right? Is the United States an enemy of Russia in any traditional geopolitical way, or is it a threat to Russia? Well, you know, it's kind of out there. It's a different. It's a different way of being. But the real problem for Russia in the real world is we used to think about geopolitics as neither the EU nor America, but it's China. And what the Russian politics of eternity does is that it forgets about that completely. The Russian politics of eternity picks on, you know, the West because it's very easy to present the West playing on, you know, some traditional Russian ways of seeing things. It's very easy to present the West as a cultural threat, as a source of decadence and so on and so forth. So what the politics of eternity does is that it, it picks an enemy that you can kind of handle politically. But it actually ignores the real problems. And this is, you know, you asked about the weaknesses of the politics of inevitability. The weakness of the politics of eternity is that by focusing on resonant threats, it distracts you from actual threats. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So and this is true everywhere. Mm -hmm. So Russia is now focused on, you know, the incredible threat of European homosexuality, which is no threat at all. Right. But what's actually a problem to Russia, I mean, to the existence of Russia as a sovereign state is Asia. That's actually a problem for Russia. But, you know, they've distracted themselves from that. I I believe that was you who said that the Internet raised a generation that is hostile to democracy. Let's finish with this. Is it so? I don't think I would have said hostile, but I don't I think I mean, what I think we have done. I mean, because I would prefer to take responsibility in my own generation rather than talk about, you know, kids these days. I think we've made a mistake in saying that history came to an end. I think we've made a mistake in raising a generation of young people in an atmosphere where we've said history doesn't matter. I think it makes it much harder for people to take responsibility and to see themselves as actors with the past and the future when you've denied them history. And I think that the, the internet makes it much harder for people to function in democracy because the internet denies you access it, it, it creates it creates a world of friends and enemies as opposed to a world where you can learn from people who are a little bit different from you are. And that's like that kind of constant learning, like the friction that's not too little friction, but not too much friction. Mm-hmm. That's what democracy is. And that's what can make democracy. So I, I, I it, it is it's 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 troubling that so few young people vote. Um, and it's also troubling that support for democracy as such, according to opinion polls, goes down as age goes down, gen- generally speaking. But I mean, me, I would prefer to take, re- I would probably take for, prefer to take responsibility at the level of parents and grandparents, right? And think about the institutions that okay. we might still improve. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You know, the very low uh, turnout of the elections, that's a whole another story, but we have no time today any longer. So thank you, Professor Snyder, for talking to me and I wish you good luck, success.
Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you too. For the full preparation. Mm -hmm. All the best. Thank to you. you. Thank you too.